Bibles to Hebrews chapter 13. This is a leadership and laity conference, and uh, we've heard a couple of powerful sermons addressed to the leadership, and uh, now this sermon is addressed to the laity. It has to do with the responsibilities of a congregation to care for the under shepherds. And so here in Hebrews chapter 13, we have uh, instruction that I will subsume under two headings. First of all, in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7, we see this, remember your leaders, and that's going to be the first point of my sermon. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. And then the second part of this sermon is taken from verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them. So that's the second point. First, remember your leaders. Secondly, obey your leaders and submit to them. For they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning. For that would be of no advantage to you. Last night uh, during the panel discussion, a question was raised uh, regarding what about people who are not necessarily connected to a church? Uh, how ought we to approach them to help them to see that, uh, that it is important for every Christian to be connected to a church? And I said at that time it was going to form the introduction to my sermon tonight, and so, uh, but I just gave a little, a little slight introduction then saying, well, you should find several things that are mentioned in the New Testament that it's impossible for someone to do unless he or she is connected with a church. And uh, I think that this is one of, one of the things that you ought to put on your list. Uh, here, Christians are told to remember your leaders. Well, a person who is not connected to a church doesn't really have a leader. If he tries to say that it's some television or radio preacher, uh, I think you should be prepared to say uh, that that doesn't count. Uh, and, then, and then you have a responsibility to obey and submit to your leaders. Is there, is there a pastor that you are obeying and submitting to? And of course, if you're not connected with a church, then you're, there, there is no one like that. You're pretty much just do, doing what you want to do. Hopefully, if you are a true believer, trying to seek the guidance of the Lord, uh, well, seeking the guidance of the Lord should lead you to what it says plainly in his word. Remember those who have the rule over you. Oh, I'm quoting from the King James Version now, but it is, it is insightful. Uh, because in the ESV it says, remember your leaders. And uh, in, the, in the King James Version it says, remember those who have the rule over you. And I think that that, that variant in translation gives us insight into the kind of leadership that is exercised here. It is a kind of leadership that carries with it authority. So a pastor uh, is in some ways like a, a tour guide who is showing you the beauties of Christ, the beauties of God's word, but he is a tour guide with a considerable amount of authority. Maybe you've been on some kind of a tour in a, in a cave or some place where there was danger of some sort, and at the outset the tour guide may say, now, we're here to have a good time, but uh, we're, we're going to have a safe time. And so you need to stay with the group. You need to uh, obey me at all times. And if you don't, then uh, you will be excluded from the tour. Well, that's, that's sort of the, the authority that the Lord has granted to pastors. Uh, it, is, it is an authority to lead, and, uh, but it carries with it the idea of rule as well. <coughs> A uh, very famous philosopher, uh, Plato, wrote a book that has been very in influential through the years called The Republic. And uh, in The Republic, he's, criti he's critical of democracies. And uh, he says that in a pure democracy, the time will come when uh, people will not make even their animals obey them. And uh, the idea is that in a pure democracy, people begin to feel uneasy about exercising authority, and people begin to feel resentful about submitting to authority. 
And um, I uh, take a walk almost every day of my life, and uh, it's a walk where I will usually have my dog healing at my side, and I will meet people who are struggling with all their might to keep their dog from running in all different directions. And they look at my dog healing, and they say, how do you, how do you get that dog to do that? And I promise you, they do not really want to know. <laughs> you don't have to be mean to the dog, but you do have to prove to the dog, I'm, you're going to obey me. Amen. <laughs> yeah, dog owner over here who appreciates that. And, and uh, so, of course, the same thing is true with children. You know, you've been in Walmart and uh, children are, are a- absolutely out of control. And part of that is that our culture has become increasingly uneasy with the idea that I have the right to tell anybody what to do, including Bowser, the dog, and certainly not my children. I I don't feel like I should be telling them what to do. And uh, so, you know, we are are pastoring in a situation like that. I remember uh, when I was endeavoring to uh, lead a church that I was pastoring to uh, embrace church discipline, after not having practiced it for more than 100 years, and I, I had a couple in my office who was not attending church at all. And they were upset because they had been informed that if they did not come to church that they were going to be dropped from the roll. And uh, so they were, they were being nice, uh, very nice at Southern Illinois. Who did I see from, who was from Murfreesboro here? So somebody I talked to at the break was from Murfreesboro. He must have left early. Uh, but uh, Southern Illinois people, really nice, very respectful to pastors, and they were. And I was talking with this couple, and I said, well, uh, the, the leadership of the church has determined that uh, we are going to meet together three times a week. And uh, she was protesting, I, I don't really need to come at all in order to be a Christian. You're saying that church attendance is something that is essential. And uh, I said, well, if, if for no other reason, the leadership of the church, I, your pastor, and others have, uh, have said, we think this is for the health of the church, that you, you should come three times a week. And this, this lady said, pretty nice, pretty nicely, she said, I don't have to obey you. And I said, let me read to you uh, Hebrews chapter 13. And uh, so I read to her Hebrews 13, 17, obey your leaders and submit to them. And to her credit, she said, I didn't know that was in there. To her discredit, they never came back to church. Uh, but uh, you know, what she expressed is what I think a lot of church members would say. I, I don't have to obey you. And then I think that sometimes we as pastors are also uh, reluctant to exercise that kind of the kind of authority with which we have been invested. And uh, I think some reluctance in that area is is laudable. It's uh, commensurate with being humble, remembering that we also are sheep and we also are sinners. But there is a point at which it becomes uh, blameworthy, becomes culpable that we are unworthy to exercise the authority that uh, the Lord has entrusted to us. Uh, But this is a sermon primarily to the laity, so let's look at what it says for uh, the members of a church to to render to their pastors. The first thing there in verse 7 is, remember your leaders. Now, you must be reminded to remember things when you have a tendency to forget. Uh, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Because it's so easy to get caught up and put off things that suddenly you have emergencies that arise on Sunday and, and then you start doing things that you'd rather not do on Sunday, which would have been avoided if you had just remembered the Sabbath day, just remembered to plan for it and make it a priority. Well, there is a tendency that I think the average person in the pew has to, uh, to forget uh, to forget their pastors. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, and so one, one reason is that much of your pastor's responsibility is carried on in secret, and it ought to be that way. So <coughs> the, the primary responsibility of a pastor is not sermon preparation, it's preacher preparation. 
And as we just heard, uh, we, we must be followers of Jesus, and that takes time. That takes time when you are not around other people. And, um, and so if, if your pastor is a man who clearly is walking with the Lord Jesus Christ, I think you feel that. I think you appreciate that. But it does keep him out of your eyesight much of the time. And then, of course, you're not the only member in the church, and so he has responsibilities to other members, and sometimes you may not hear about it. And so much of his work is not carried on under the eyesight of uh, someone who is to remember his pastor. Uh, so be sure, be sure to remember your leaders. Um, and then there's... Do you remember how weird, weird you felt the first time you saw your first grade teacher in the grocery store? That you just thought, wow, I just didn't know that she existed anywhere other than in the classroom. And uh, similar to that, I think, is uh, the moment when you, it first dawned on, me, on, first dawned on you that your parents were real people. Uh, because, uh, you know, just for years and years, you could just kind of take it for granted there. They are, they are parents, and they have these certain powers uh, to, to see in the dark and, and all sorts of things and, uh, and don't really think of them. And sometimes it's not until we are adults and rearing our own children that we think, wow, my parents did a really good job. Or, wow, my parents had a lot of wisdom here. I, uh, I wasn't converted until I was about 14 years old. Um, my dad was a preacher, a very faithful man of God, uh, but I wasn't converted until I was about 14. Up until that time, which took me through my ninth grade in school, I uh, had pretty much done as little as I possibly could at school. And uh, uh, I... I sometimes took delight in giving the teachers a hard time and uh, got, got in a fair amount of trouble. Not, not deep, bad trouble, but just kind of wasn't really, wasn't really putting effort into it. And I certainly wasn't giving the teachers the respect that they deserved. And then I was converted just after I had finished the ninth grade. And uh, then a, a church camp that I loved and I thought that I, this church camp thought that I'd been a believer for many years, contacted me and asked me if I could come and work there for the remainder of the summer. So I was going to go be a camp counselor. I was a new Christian myself, but they didn't know that. I didn't know that. I thought that I just kind of rededicated my life. And uh, did, it was about three years later that I came to understand I really was not converted until I was about 14. So anyway, this camp, uh, this camp called me, and part of my responsibility as a camp counselor was to teach Bible studies. And uh, so here I was teaching Bible studies to these kids. They were supposed to be at least nine years old to go to camp. Uh, but sometimes you know, I was 14 and I was teaching uh, young people who were almost my own age. And I, I began to feel how difficult, what a challenge it was to teach. And then it occurred to me I have been giving my teachers at school an unnecessary hard time. And so when I went back to school, much to everyone's amazement, I moved physically from the back of the class, where I could cut up as much as possible, to the front of the class, where it was going to be unlikely that I could cut up and get away with it. And um, there were many other things that, uh, that happened as a result of my conversion, but one of the good things was I gained an appreciation for people who had the responsibility of teaching me. And there are some people in the church who have never quite been able to experience that, what I've illustrated under three illustrations. You see your, your teacher in Kroger for the first time. You, you think of your parents as humans for the first time. <coughs> You think of teachers as people who have feelings. You begin to think of referees as people who have feelings, and you shouldn't yell and scream at them. And, uh, and the, but there are some people who seem to just never come out of themselves and look at someone who has been placed in authority over them and saying, hey, they've got feelings. 
It must be discouraging to my pastor if I don't show up. It must be discouraging to my pastor if I'm playing with my cell phone when I'm in church. It must be discouraging to my pastor when, uh, when I'm not paying attention to, uh, to him at all. Um, but you should. You should remember those who have the, the rule over you. Remember those who are your leaders. It's so easy to forget them because much of their work is done out, out from under your view. And then also sometimes we just don't make that transition of, of considering that this person has, has feelings and this, this person has needs and that I can meet some of them. So remember your leaders. How are they leaders? How do pastors exercise the rule over you? There are three things that are mentioned here in this text. Let's, let's look at them. First of all, they are leaders because they speak to you the word of God. If he is a man of God, he's not just spouting off his own ideas. Okay? He's not just uh, spouting off something that he's read in, in Reader's Digest or some interesting magazine. He has been digging in the word of God. He feels a responsibility to be a spokesman for God. And so you should respect and follow him because, and remember him because he is speaking to you the word of God. That's the first reason. Second reason is consider the outcome of their way of life. Think about how their lives are going to turn out. Now, a pastor's life is not always easy, and so you mustn't make it a mark of a life worthwhile if, a, if someone has a lot of leisure, if someone has an easy life. But I, uh, in preparing to preach this sermon, I just tried to think, do I know of anyone who has earnestly walked with the Lord and preached, even though he may have preached in a small congregation, even though he may have been underpaid? Do, I, I don't know of any pastor who who at the conclusion, a conclusion of his life was saying, well, I sure do wish I'd done something else. No, not if he's, not if he's a God-called man. He thinks, this is what the Lord has called me to do. It's what the Lord has equipped me to do. God, with God's help, I have done it to the best of my ability. I fought a good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, and not for me only, but for all those who love his appearing. Consider the outcome of their way of life. In contrast to that, uh, consider the old adage that the devil does not have many happy old people. And that's true. Because many of the pleasures with which Satan has lured people into wasting their lives lose their keenness lose their attraction, lose their allure when you get old. You don't taste things as well and, uh, and uh, other interests that were highly motivating to you earlier just seem to pass away. When I start talking like that, I always remember <clears throat> uh, going into a, a nursing home room where uh, I had a man that I visited on a weekly basis and uh, he was a believer and uh, but he, he shared a room with a man who had been a very successful businessman and uh, the uh, the believer ha had his leg amputated and uh, I guess he had a lot of reasons from a worldly perspective to be sour but he wasn't he was always cheerful I can hear his can hear his unique accent even now greeting me and talking to me and uh, and then I would always speak to the man who was in the room with him, the man who had been a successful businessman. And one night I uh, just said, hey, Mr. Smith, have they brought you your supper yet? And he picked up his, uh, his urinal. Thankfully, it wasn't full. And he threw it at me. I didn't know he had been a professional baseball pitcher as well. <laughs> I saw it coming and turned around, but he nailed me right between the shoulder blades with this urinal. And he no, they haven't brought me my blankety blank blank supper. And uh, the man I visited said, "Here, here now. No need for that kind of talk." <laughs> Just what a contrast! What a contrast! You're you're two old people in the nursing home. One of them is happy. The other one, who has had many of the great things of life, bitter, hard. So when you think about those who are your leaders. One of the things you ought to consider is the outcome of their way of life. 
It is a way of blessing. It is a way that the Lord rewards. And uh, so you should, you should think, uh, you should remember them because they speak the word of the Lord. Remember them because of the way that their life turned out. And then also imitate their faith. That's the third thing that we have there in verse 7. Imitate their faith. That is a way that they, they lead you. Um, I'm always thinking about faith. I just down through the years thinking about faith. Why, why is it that the Lord chose faith to be the virtue by which we are united to Christ? Now I think that there's something misleading about that very question. Why is it that faith is the virtue by which we are united to Christ? Uh, the question seems to leave open the possibility that it might have been some other virtue. Maybe courage. So instead of saying, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, the Lord might have just as well said, be very courageous and you will be saved. Or faith uh, is not as great as love. Why didn't the Lord choose love as the virtue by which we are united to Christ? Uh, what must I do to be saved? Love the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. But instead the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. I think that I have had, and many people have, a tendency to think of faith as something analogous to money. Uh, so uh, that you exchange it for salvation. You've got faith. God says, well, how much faith have you got? Well, if it's just a little bit, I'll take it. Okay, here, I'll give you salvation because you've got faith. Think of it kind of like a, if you were going to go buy a, a a hamburger at Burger King, and uh, and you pay you pay six dollars for the Whopper. the The money that you give does not really have any organic connection to that Whopper. But some people think that's what faith is. It's just kind of like money that you give in exchange for something that you want from God. Instead, faith is like eating the Whopper. Faith is the means by which you become a participant in the thing that you want. It, it, is the means, it is the means by which you participate in the blessings of the gospel. You become united to Christ because when you exercise faith, you are thinking like Jesus. You are agreeing with God about Jesus. And uh, so... A person who is a leader in the church certainly ought to be someone who is always, whose mind and heart are always enmeshed with the mind and heart of God. And of course, that is going to affect the way that he looks at all things, including the congregation over which he has been set as the leader. So remember uh, those who have... Uh, have the rule over you. Remember those who have been designated your leaders. Three good reasons who are given here. They speak to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Now, how are we to remember them? I don't think this is uh, just to say, call them to mind the way you would an old classmate that you graduated with. But instead, remember them in some specific ways. <coughs> Remember them, first of all, in prayer. Uh, I have heard that bad preaching is God's judgment on a prayerless church. Now, I think that's often true. Uh, how blessed are you by your pastor's preaching? I wonder if there's any connection between your praying for him and his effectiveness to speak to you, or your failing to pray for him and his ineffectiveness to speak to you. Remember him in prayer. I, if you're successful at praying at all, I think surely you have got some kind of system. That is that you follow the model prayer as your guide. That's what I do. Or you have a prayer list. You have certain times that you pray. Uh, is your leadership at church part of that time? So if you're going to if you're going to fit him if you're praying through the model prayer like I am, then uh, under the category of "May Your Kingdom Come," 
you may at that time think, well, God's kingdom is advanced primarily through churches these days. And so, Father, I just lift up to you my pastor. I pray that you'll keep him a holy man, keep him in your word, uh, help him to preach uh, sermons that my children can understand, that I can understand and benefit from. Help me to love him and uh, just pray for my pastor. So remember him in prayer. And then a very specific way that the scriptures stipulate that we ought to remember our pastors is to remember them financially. Now that's not mentioned in this text, but keep your finger here because I'm coming back to it and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Now while you're turning to 1 Timothy chapter 5, let me say that uh, I am not complaining about my salary. <laughs> because uh, the church where I pastor is extraordinarily generous and I am so blessed and, uh, and so I'm, I'm not hoping that somebody from the Bullet Lick Baptist Church will watch this on YouTube and raise my salary. Although if you feel led, then <laughs> just want to let you know that all of the salary increases that you give me go towards feeding the poor and hungry. Namely, my wife and children. <laughs> but here in, uh, I, but I, there are a lot of churches who need to hear the next five minutes really, really badly. Because they don't pay their preachers what they ought to. They don't pay their, pre they don't pay their preachers what they might. I have... Uh, I've been in the ministry as long as Tom Ascot. He's pastored for 45 years. I've been preaching for 45 years. He's a little older than I am. Uh, but uh, And so during that time, uh, I've been in some staff positions at churches where they were not as generous as, as Bullet Lick Baptist Church is. I hate to keep mentioning Bullet Lick because I know that it makes all of you pastors envious that you're not pastor of a church that has such a cool name. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, it is the Bullet Lick, B-U-L-L-I-T-T, -T, Bullet Lick. Bullet was a man's name, and there was a Salt Lick right there where the church is located. So that area is called Bullet Lick. And uh, but anyway, I was I was pastor of a small church. Uh, don't want to be embarrassing to anyone who might who might listen to this on the internet, uh, but they uh, they were not a very big church and they could not have paid me very much. But uh, at the end of my ministry there, uh, one of the reasons that I was moving on uh, was because if I stayed there, I was going to have to become bivocational, and I just hoped that the Lord would open up a ministry opportunity so that I could continue to devote my full time to. Uh, to ministry and prayer and, and pastoring churches. And the Lord did open up that opportunity. And so I had announced very tearfully, I was crying, they were crying, that I was leaving. <clears throat> In the next few days, I was on the roof of the church with uh, a man who had been converted under my ministry. And so he loved me, I loved him. And uh, we were up there fixing the roof. And uh, he said, well, Jim, I know that one of the reasons you had to... Uh, look for something else is because we couldn't pay you more. Now, I know you're not doing it for the money, but he said, uh, oh, we might have been able to uh, come up with an extra $100 a month, but what would that matter? Now, I love this man, but I came close to throwing him off that roof. <laughs> <clears throat> because $100 a month at that time in my life, my goodness, what that would have meant. But for him, you know, he, he made a salary probably four or five times what I was making. For him, $100 a month was nothing. Um, and, uh, he, but he was, he was one of those people, and that was one of those churches where there was no one in the church who was in a, a vocational position of administration. So they were never considering, in their everyday work, they were never considering what to pay someone else they were always on the other end of that. They were always on, we're going to go on strike if we don't get this salary. We're going to go on strike if we don't have this benefit. And they weren't thinking that way. And that's the way it is with a lot of small churches. There aren't people who own businesses. There aren't people who are in uh, positions of authority. And so they don't think about uh, the pastor's salary in the way that they should. 
I recommend that you appoint some kind of a committee that once a year, at least once a year, considers the pastor's salary. Uh, my own father faithfully pastored the same church for nearly 50 years. And for the last, now this will be embarrassing to anyone at that church who hears this, but they ought to be embarrassed. For the last 20 years, he never got one single raise. And uh, I became aware of that when he still had several years of ministry left at that church. And he was talking to me about a ministry position that was available. And uh, the salary, so this is, this is about the year 2002. So the salary at that church was about $30,000 a year. And uh, so he, asked, he was asking me, did I know anyone who would be willing to, uh, to go for that salary? And I, and I knew it to be a good church, and so I said, well, you know, I'm sure it would be a, I'm sure it would be a pay cut for you, uh, but would you consider that church? And he just kind of laughed. He said, uh, I haven't had a raise in, I think at that time it was 15 years. He still was not making over $20,000 a year. And he'd been pastor of that church for, for over 40 years at that time. This was a church that... Uh, that uh, gave a lot to missions. So they would, <clears throat> some years, give over $100,000 a year to missions. But they were content to pay their pastor less than $20,000 a year. Now, I love those people. And uh, when, I, when I go home uh, to that church, that I have a standing invitation to preach at homecoming there every year. When they hear this, they might not ask me back. <clears throat> but I love those people from the bottom of my heart. And love me but that was not right and I began to I began to communicate with some of the leadership of that church to try and, and uh, get my my parents a little financial security for their their retirement which was pending I'm going to say something that I intended to say later I, I haven't forgotten that we're going to read here in first Timothy chapter 5 I I think that the number one priority, the number one financial priority of a local church is to make sure that her pastor is well provided for financially. And I, I think that uh, I think that it should take precedence either, even over foreign mission endeavors, and here's one of the reasons why. Most people throughout the history of the world have been saved through the preaching of pastors. Uh, when I was uh, teaching at Boyce College, I would ask this question fairly often. How many people in here, I'm not, I'm not asking you to raise your hands, although it would probably work in here, but I'm not asking you to raise your hands. How many people in here were saved through a one-on-one -on -one cold turkey witnessing interview? Very rare that there are some people who were saved that way. So maybe one hand. Let's say one hand goes up. How many people in here were saved through a, a religious broadcast? Two people will say, have you ever heard of Paul Washer? Yeah, I've heard of Paul Washer. <clears throat> yeah, I got saved by watching Paul Washer on the internet. So there are a couple of people who got saved through watching Paul Washer on the internet. Uh, what, about, uh, what about through reading the Bible on your own? So you're in a hotel room, you get Gideon's Bible, or some other way. Almost no one. Uh, and I'll, I'll go through several other things. I'm in favor of all of those things. But then I'll get to the last question. I'll say, how many of you were saved through the preaching of a pastor in a local church? Consistently, 90% of the hands go up. And uh, as far as I can tell from church history, that's the way it has been for 2,000 years. That the main way that people get saved is through the preaching of pastors of local churches and the influence of families. So if you want to impact the kingdom of God, make it so that your pastor can pastor without distraction as much as you are able. And uh, so I think that it's a very powerful mission tool. And here's something else that happens. If the preaching is good, then sometimes the Lord blesses that people will come to hear it. 
and that the church grows stronger. And then the church is able to do, invest more in foreign missions work and so on. But you may disagree with me, and when it's your turn to preach, you can say what you believe. But I think that the primary financial responsibility of a local church is to make sure that her pastor is well taken care of. Now let's see what it says here in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Now what kind of honor is he talking about? Verse 18 explains. For the scripture says you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. And the laborer deserves his wages. So it's talking about money. The example is in the Old Testament law, you've got that old ox who's hitched up to some kind of a beam and she's, he's walking round and round and round and round and Every once in a while that old ox wants to reach down and get a bite of that grain that he's threshing out. And there were some people who were just so stingy that they'd put a muzzle on the ox. They didn't want him eating any of that grain. And the Lord said, don't do that. And then here it's applied to pastors. Don't, don't put a muzzle on that man. This is the way Paul puts it in, in the book of Romans. The Jews who have shared in, uh, I'm, I'm messing up the quotation, uh, those who have shared in spiritual blessings ought to share physical blessings is the gist of it. I'm not getting the quotation exactly right. But don't, don't muzzle the ox while, remember that he has financial needs. Remember, remember that he has a family if he does have a family. Uh, be careful not to, uh, re remember that he has a reputation. Look here in, at verse 18. Verse 19, do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. Rocky was telling us last night, someone starts that gossip, say, oh, hold on there. Uh, are you talking about the pastor? Let me get two or three witnesses to get this. And that's probably going to put an end to it right there. Uh, the, the, but the, the, remember your pastor's reputation. Don't, remember your pastor's reputation in front of your children for crying out loud. I mean, if you want your, your kids to have respect for the pastor and to listen in church, then don't badmouth him on all the drive home and when you're, sitting at, when you're sitting at lunch on Sunday. Remember your pastor's reputation. And uh, so <clears throat> back to Hebrews chapter 13. Remember your leaders. Remember them in prayer. Remember them financially. Remember their reputation. And then... Let's skip down secondly. It'll be much briefer, verse 17, because I've already preached almost everything I intended to say. So in verse 17, obey your leaders and submit to them. I think this is a level of authority that is granted to pastors that the average, uh, pa uh, the average church member doesn't recognize and the average pastor doesn't want to embrace. But there it is. Obey your leaders and submit to them. It sounds like the same sort of language. It is the same sort of language that is used to talk about the proper ordering of a Christian household. Wives, submit to your husbands and obey them in the Lord. And really the relationship is very similar. Uh, those, uh, every man in here, I think, believes that uh, the husband is the head of the wife. Now I'm not asking you to raise your hands. But I'm just wondering, when was the last time you made your wife do something that she didn't want to do? It almost never happens. Even, even though we have been granted the authority, we just know that's not a productive way to rule things. <laughs> and uh, so it's, it's part of wise leadership to use your authority uh, discreetly. And there are times when you have to be, you have to be, be very frank. And certainly if, uh, if those entrusted to your authority are doing something wrong, then you must correct them and sometimes rebuke them sharply. And sometimes that is the responsibility of a pastor. But that's not the usual way that it's going to be carried on. That's not the usual way that God deals with us. In Romans it says, Do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness? tolerance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you to repentance. 
In one of the Psalms, the, the psalmist uh, speaking in the voice of the Lord says, Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. It's like, just before that, the Lord says, I will guide you with my eye. And then the next thing he says is, do not be like the horse or the mule. So, you know when it was when you were a little kid and you were misbehaving in church and your mom, and your mom or your dad gave you this look. And you knew right then, we better quit what we're doing. You were guided with the eye. And then maybe there was another look that said, you're going to get it when you get home. <laughs> and you start wondering, is there anything? If I take notes, is there anything that I can do to get out of this spanking? And uh, the, Lord the Lord has those looks. And they're usually looks of kindness. Uh, but if, if the look of kindness doesn't work, then he's got the bit and the bridle. And some of you know how a bit and a bridle works. Some of you have never been around horses. You don't realize that when you ride a horse, you put a metal piece in that horse's mouth that makes the horse obey you. It, uh, it hurts the horse if he doesn't go where you want him to go. Uh, <clears throat> when a couple of my daughters were real young, they came crying into my, into my room one time, and, and Grace said, Naomi hurt me. Naomi's deathly afraid of spankings. I didn't mean to. I said, okay, okay, just settle down. What happened? Naomi, she's about three years old. She said, well, I just did this to her. She reaches around her head and grabs her like this. And, and, uh, and Grace said, hey, you know, that's just a little bit too much to show and dad what happened. She did the same thing again. I was really kind of proud of her for doing that move. I hadn't taught her. You know, that's called the fish hook. You can control somebody. You get your get your 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 fish hook inside their mouth. You can get their mouth, you can get their head to go where you want it to go. And uh, but that's that's the principle that the Lord says. Don't be like that. I can put a fish hook on you. I can put a ring in your nose and lead you around. If you're going to act big, big bullheaded, I can put a ring in your nose and and lead you around. That's not the that's not my first preference. One of the Puritans said, God blesses with his right hand. He takes up the rod with his left hand. It's not his first preference. And of course, as pastors who want to imitate the Lord, then uh, being harsh or being sharp is not our first preference. We'll do it when it's necessary. God help us. But that's not the first preference. Uh, so, but the scriptures say, obey your leaders, submit to them, <coughs> For they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. And that is a punch in the stomach right there for those of us who are pastors. We're going to have to answer for this. And uh, so it seems to me like the, uh, the emphasis of this scripture is consider what a heavy job these guys have. They are going to have to answer for God we have to answer to God for the way that they have shepherded your soul. So why don't you give them a little cooperation? Look at what it says next. Submit to them. They have to give account for your soul. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. In other words, uh, the scripture is saying, put yourself in their position. And you do, a, you do a little pastoral work in reverse. You just think, this guy has got a hard job to do. I'm going to try to make it as pleasurable for him as possible. And it says, if, if he has to do it with groaning, that is no advantage to you. I think one of the implications there is, if your pastor is happy, then you are going to be better taken care of. If it's always just a big grief and you're always causing trouble, then uh, he's human. It's not going to be advantageous to you to always be uh, causing, causing him trouble. Now don't, uh, don't let that 
keep anyone who is in need from contacting your pastor when you need care. I, uh, what I'm warning against here, and I think what this is warning against, is people who are being belligerent to their pastor. Uh, when you have needs, your pastor wants to care for your needs. Uh, but uh, the teaching of this passage of Scripture is your pastor also has needs. And uh, may this awaken you to, to see some of it, to remember him, to obey your leaders, and to submit to them.